So I, um, so I'm never going to be able to be a stand-up comedian like Howard Schumner. But you know, at my age, it actually doesn't matter. I don't really care if anybody laughs anymore. So it's actually the way I just torture my son is I just threaten to be funny. So it's uh, I, I can't lose on this one. So I appreciate being here. I had a great time la last time a couple years ago. It was a remarkable experience. It's fun being in front of a group that I don't have to argue with and convince that this is the way to go. So it's a pretty big difference for me and very inspiring. So my goal today is to try to try to pull the day together and give you a comprehensive overview is that every treatment and approach that we have discussed works. But I want you to understand why it works and where in the pain cascade that it works. So what happened to me is that I've been practicing about four years in Seattle. I came out of one of the top spine fellowships in the world and was under a tremendous amount of stress. And I was handling it well and just had this attitude, just bring it on. I really can handle almost anything. And I was driving across a bridge in Seattle, the Lake Washington Bridge, and as, as I descended onto the freeway ramp at 10 o'clock at night, I started to sweat. I started to feel a racing heart. I started to feel faint, and I actually thought I was dying. I thought I had a heart attack. What was happening, I was having the first of many panic attacks I was gonna have over the next 13 years, but I had no idea what was going on. So the next 13 years, I developed ringing in my ears, migraine headaches, burning in my feet, migratory skin rashes, extreme anxiety, had obsessive compulsive disorder, major depression, and it just went on and on and on, and I had no idea what was going on. So I didn't become a major complex spine surgeon by having anxiety. In fact, I was extremely successful in suppressing it. And I really hadn't experienced much anxiety until that night on the bridge. And it was really perplexing about what had happened. Because I did it right. I had worked hard, responsible, was doing a good job. The stresses were the normal stresses you have by becoming a spine surgeon. I keep pointing out to my wife, by the way, that normal people actually don't become spine surgeons. It's not a normal thing to do, right? <laughs> Come on. So now I know that. I didn't know that 40 years ago. So I want to describe the nervous system in its entirety, just as the junction box, peripheral nerves, central nerves, the brain, the spinal cord, et cetera, just a central processing area called the junction box. And your body takes all the sensory input every millisecond and processes it. I learned a new term from this book that Howard mentioned, Howard Emotions, you may call it introception, we're also getting feedback from your stomach, chest, abdomen, et cetera. And all these senses are competing for attention all the time. So in every millisecond, there's just some total, either pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. So if your general sum total is pleasant, your body's gonna secrete oxytocin, dopamine, and you're gonna have a very relaxed feeling. But when you feel relaxed, you're just feeling that chemical surge. Same thing with stepping on a tack, hearing a, a loud sound, being startled, et cetera, being threatened physically, your body secre secretes adrenaline, cortisol, and endorphins and other stress chemicals, and you have this unpleasant sensation, you feel anxiety. So when you feel anxiety, you're just feeling that chemical surge, okay? It's a result of a cascade of events. So William Shakespeare may have been the first neuroscientist, and his, from Hamlet, this came from my wife, by the way. I actually don't know Shakespeare at all. So this is her slide. I have a, quite the coach here, as Howard knows. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So humans have a major problem called consciousness that other animals don't have. So most living creatures can avoid anxiety by avoiding control and escaping, and then they remain safe. If they're unsuccessful, of course, they don't survive. So humans have, it's been shown in the last five years of neuroscience research fairly clearly that thoughts create the same, air, they go to the same area of the brain, they light up similar circuits, they create almost an identical chemical responses as other sensory input. So again, thoughts are competing for your attention, and so if they're pleasant, again, the reward chemicals, you feel relaxed. Unpleasant thoughts, you yield unpleasant sensations, you feel anxious. But the problem that humans have that other animals don't have is that you can't escape your thoughts. You can't escape them, right? So we do what we know what to do, is that we either suffer, mask, or suppress. And if somebody has another suggestion, I'm open to it, because I actually thought about this for about 10 years, but what else do we do? So chronic pain, as many in this room know, it always gets worse with time. 
People come and say, well, my pain's worse than it was five years ago, so there must be something going on in my body that's abnormal. Well, again, just repetition, your body circuits become more and more embedded, and chronic pain always gets worse with time without an intervening, there usually is not an intervening additional injury, even though people want to attribute it to an injury. We all know about masking, is that there's various types of addictions, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, eating, et cetera. And the thrill seekers, you know, we, we jokingly say, well, you're addicted to the adrenaline. Well, guess what? They are. And so the one that I sort of rationalized is the workaholic one. And I was talking to my daughter a few years ago, and she says, you know, I'm really not a workaholic because I really, really love what I do. And she goes, well, every addict likes their drug. <laughs> goes, okay. I, I love kids. And, they do, and then, again, my son has this whole other set of things that he talks about. But anyway, and this is what I did. You know, I just mastered suppressing stress. I mean, that's what I did. I was tough. I was good. Um, I succeeded. I did very, very well. And I just turned off the spigot. And I honestly didn't feel much anxiety until those panic attacks occurred when I was about 38 years old. So Dr. Wagner out of Harvard did a study in 1987 where he asked college volunteers to not think about white bears. And of course, as you know, you think about white bears more, right? But he also demonstrated a major trampoline effect that not only did you think about white bears more, you thought about them a lot more. It was a major trampoline effect. So suppressing actually works consciously, but as we all know in this room, you can't lie to your, your body doesn't believe that. So by suppressing thoughts and emotions, you're really cranking up the nervous system. So why is it so persistent? Well, I liken the problem to an athlete or an artist. I talk to my patients all the time. There's a book I recommend called The Talent Code, which is about the formation of genius linked to neuroscience. Basically, where there's an athlete, artist, and musician with repetition of deep learning and master coaching, you lay down these circuits that become very embedded. For that to be specific repetitions in chronic pain qualifies. You have a pain coming in from a certain body part. The problem with chronic pain is it comes in so rapidly. So it's been shown that your brain memorizes the circuits pretty consistently after about, three to, after about six to 12 months. It actually shifts to a different part of the brain where the pain centers go quiet and the emotional centers light up. So it's like riding a bicycle. Is that once you know how to ride a bicycle, you know how to ride a bicycle. You really can't unlearn, unlearn how to ride a bicycle by consciously trying to unlearn it. There's ways of disrupting pathways, but once you know how to ride a bicycle, you know how to do that. So I use an analogy a lot with my patients is that these are permanent pathways that the more you try to fight them or fix them, the worse it's gonna get. So their eyes open right up and go, well, that doesn't sound very good. So that's a problem, okay? We all know about phantom limb pain, which I was a North Peak resident. I did my share of amputations, and it's dramatic to watch an arm or a leg go into the bucket. I mean, it's pretty dramatic. But 55% of patients feel the leg, and they feel the same pain they had before the surgery. In that arm story that we, we just talked about, is that one surgeon amputated 15 normal arms for chronic pain, none of them got better. These are dead normal arms. So it's always perplexed me for 30 years, what's, what's all that about? I mean, why wouldn't we just go right after that, just like penicillin as being an issue? It's a pretty dramatic deal. So you're trapped by your thoughts. You are full of adre adrenaline. But then you have the, in the additional insult of pain. So how what would happen to your anxiety if, I, if you put your hand over a stove? Go up. And Dave, what would happen if I took your hand and forced you to hold it over the stove? What would be your next emotion? Anger. Anger, yeah, you'd be pissed off. So it's frustrating, so your hand in chronic pain, essentially, you are stuck over a hot stove. You can't get away, you're totally trapped. So you're trapped by your thoughts, you're trapped by the pain, you're probably trapped by finances or circumstances or relationship, whatever. So we get trapped by all sorts of different things, but being trapped by pain is particularly onerous. Dr. Charnold used the term rage, which again took me years to understand where he came from. We just spoke about 30 years ago. And it's when you're that trapped with no hope, where do you go? What do you do? So what happens is that you have a very, very sensitized body that's being assaulted by adrenaline every day. 
And it's like driving a car down the freeway in second or third gear is that eventually it's just gonna break down. You can't have the kind of adrenaline, cortisol, other stress chemical assault that pronounced for that long and not get sick. So that's why there's so many symptoms of this process because every organ system is gonna react in its own way, right? So your heart's gonna do one thing, stomach do another thing. Um, Dr. Abbas, who's known well in this group, who is a remarkably particular researcher, breaks it down into four categories of skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, um, central nervous system issues, and conversion reactions. So it was Dr. Schumer's book that taught me there's over 30 symptoms of an adrenalized nervous system, and I had 16 of them at the same time. And again, had no idea what the heck was going on. So we've had to mention a couple times about you know, resistance to change, why aren't people more open to change and more open to these ideas. Well, there's a tremendous benefit to being angry, okay? So first of all, remember our human survival depends on avoiding anxiety, which means you feel vulnerable. We don't like that feeling at all. So anger feels powerful, and guess what? It is powerful. It's also destructive, okay? So it's designed to make you, allow you to survive no matter what the cost. So if people get addicted to it, they don't want to give up the power of anger. It's by far and away the biggest block to actually engage in these tools. Secondly, from an evolutionary standpoint, the species that could actually produce the most anger and most power had the highest chance of surviving, right? So again, it's an evolutionary process that everyone in this room has ancestors who are actually very good at being powerful and angry and actually surviving. So the problem is that you feel powerful, it actually covers up the feeling of anxiety, but at the same time you're just cranking the adrenaline right through the roof. There's also a physiological, re physiological reward for anger. So Copeland did a series of studies on school children who were bullied. He found out that the children who were bullied had a higher level of inflammatory markers than the kids who weren't bullied. Okay, that was disturbing, that was very consistent. What was more disturbing to me in this paper was that the bullies had a lower level of inflammatory markers, and that was consistent. So there's a fit, not only is there evolutionary reasons for hanging on to anger, there's actually a physiological reward. So then of course the more power you have, the more control you have, so look at human history. So it's governed almost 95%, maybe more, of power and control. So a few people like Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Confucius, and other people have broken through that with very enlightened views, but in general, they haven't actually changed the way the world runs, because it's still mostly about power and control. There's a lot of benefit to remaining angry. So how do humans cope with anxiety? So we just talked about anger, actually, is a very good coping skill. It was actually my go-to skill for many years. I just didn't recognize it. So there's only two things that I'm aware of, basic categories of coping skills that humans deal with, is control and rigid structured thinking. So obviously the antidote to anxiety is control. If something causes distress, you're gonna control yourself or the situation or the person to solve the problem. Unfortunately, most things that makes us anxious are not subject, not subject to control, right? Including our thoughts, we just talked about that. So you can control by escaping stress, but eventually it becomes very tedious and stressful trying to avoid stress. So even though you're aware of the triggers, if you spend your life trying to avoid all these triggers, your life becomes progressively smaller. The second factor that people use is rigid structured structure thinking, whereas you get a set of pathways going in your brain, extreme idealism, political beliefs, religious beliefs, and your brain just picks a pathway that's there, is familiar, and it stays off the anxiety circuits, works pretty well. Unfortunately, as you well know, you start imposing your way of living under other people, and one of the reasons we have so much societal angst right now is we have a lot of rigid thinking going on, a lot of black and white thinking, that's a symptom of anxiety, but doesn't create an awareness of the problem. So both control and rigid structured thinking completely block awareness. And of course, in any arena, you have to be aware of the problem before you can solve it. So how do you solve it? 
what do you do? So you have permanent pathways. Our coping skills are not very good. And so what do you do? So you have these permanent circuits that are embedded. They're not going anywhere. So to jump way ahead at the end of the story, you actually become comfortable with uncomfortable sensations. Because you try to fix them or solve them, you're placing neurological tension onto those circuits, right? So I tell my patients, you might as well put your hand right into a hornet's nest, right? You, you can't, you have all these survival patterns that are running the show, you're trying to escape and trying to fix them. And I give my daughter a hard time because she's trying to find herself. I go, well, guess what? You're not gonna find yourself in these reactive survival patterns. It's not there. So what happens is that you learn to separate and redirect. So the way you solve chronic pain is you, it's a learned skill that we'll talk about in a second but you learn to separate and then redirect. So the metaphor I like to use is directing a river into a different channel, and as you nurture this set of channels more, this set of circuits starts to atrophy. And as you start, you start moving away from the pain. You can't solve pain, you can't solve anxiety, but you develop a whole part of your brain that's pain-free. So I'm gonna spend a second to tell you how, I, how not to solve chronic pain. So my scenario was I was raised in a very abusive, chaotic background. My score was at least five, maybe more, depends how you keep the score. And anxiety and anger were the norm, pretty much. And in retrospect, my migraine headaches started, like I mentioned before, when I was five years old. And my particular coping skills were overachieving. And when I was a kid, it was about guilt, perfectionism, being very judgmental, being very critical, very, very rigid thinker. And it was just a really incredibly disturbing experience, until I was 15 years old, I simply said, look, there's something wrong here. I honestly didn't know what it was, because my mother would just beat the crap out of us, then 10 minutes later tells us, she, tells us how much she loved her, loved us, going, really? And then I, I remember in eighth grade, which is pretty old, really, about saying, well, at least I know my parents love me. So it was very confusing for a kid of confusing violence with love, right? So at age 15 years old, I just shut the door. And the psychological term, I guess, would be dissociating. And so I spent a lot of energy constructing a persona of David Hanscom, which I became, I worked at hard at grades. I, did, I tried to become athletic, but I told how I, I missed five ground balls in a row when I was playing baseball in eighth grade. So I tried. Um, I became a hard worker. I became responsible. So I put on all these, I'll use the word facades, even though they were really um, noble efforts, and the amount of energy spent creating this persona was unbelievable. So remember my junior year in college, I was taking 21 hours of classwork, I was playing intramurals, I was active socially, I worked 10 hours of heavy construction work a week, and I had a 4.0 GPA. So what I didn't do was sleep, right? But I did, I was having a great time, particularly compared to my past, right? So I, I was having the time of my life, really, but I was just going 1,000 miles an hour but well, that's what, quote, made me successful was that hyperactivity, right? So I did it, went into residency orthopedics, hard to get into, when I taught spine fellowships in the world. So I, quote, did it. But my second year in residency, I dropped out of the church I was raised in, and it just wasn't working for me. But I had a vague sense this is a really bad idea. And I respect the people that are still in the church. I think it's a great thing for many people sense of community, outlook, et cetera, I think it's great. For me personally, it was a set of rigid thinking that wasn't helping me personally. But I started noticing my feet started to burn, um, my ears started to ring, um, these odd thought patterns started to come into place. And it was after that divorce that things, the wheels really fell off. But in retrospect, what happened, I gave up the rigid thinking, I became more aware, I started to let emotions in that were uncomfortable, but I didn't know what to do, right? What do I do? So I did this badly. I mean, I really, really crashed and burned. So now, with the tools and things that we know, we can actually solve the problem without having to do this crash and burning mode. So how do we do that? So there's three aspects of it. You become aware of the problem. You address all aspects at the same time. The patient takes charge. So let's talk about awareness, and it's been outlined nicely with Howard and Dave's talks about, you have to be aware of the diagnosis. I work up everybody. I don't want to miss a structural problem. 
And I can tell you if you miss a structural problem in an angry patient with chronic pain, you're just dead. And I've done that, and it's, but it's not good for anybody. But patients want to know, they want to be reassured, and I get it. So I don't try to be cost effective. I just work them up, don't even ask questions. I never assume it's a neurological disorder. I always work them up, every time. In my stage of the game, they come in with workups already done, so I occasionally do more workup. The second awareness is chronic pain. What we've learned today is become aware of the nature of chronic pain, just education. But the third thing is that there's many variables that affect chronic pain, and what are your variables that affect in your life that are affecting chronic pain? So awareness is the first step. The second step is to address all the variables. The variables that I've outlined is, and there's many of them, but this is my basic categories, and sort of how this whole process evolved is simply understanding pain, education. Sleep is huge. It's actually the trump card. I tell my patients, look, if you're not sleeping, nothing else works. Forget about this entire conversation. Stress is huge. We talked a lot about that today. Uh, medication stabilization. I always stabilize medications where they're at because you try to drop medications down too quickly, guess what? Anxiety goes up and their pain goes up. So I, I've had people in, on as much as 2,000 milligrams of morphine, equivalent, morphine equivalents a day come off all their meds, no pain. Guess what? They did it themselves. They took control. Life outlook is big with forgiveness, which has been talked about today earlier. And the physical, physical conditioning is a, is a huge part of this process. So everything works, but nothing works in isolation. That's the key. So the metaphor I use is like fighting a fire, forest fire. And unfortunately, I live right close to Napa Valley, and this is what Napa Valley looked like on the news the other day, is that it takes a multi-pronged attack to fight a forest fire. You have fire lines, you have firefighters, you have airplanes with chemicals and water. Every strategy on that firefight fire, to fight that fire is really critical. You're not gonna fight the fire with just one strategy. It can't work. So then my first book, I saw a paper that said that surgeons are routinely ignoring the variables that affect chronic pain before they do surgery. So I looked at that a little bit and go, okay, but I also thought that if you are having chronic, if you're having a structural problem in the face of chronic pain, that people in chronic pain did not tolerate the additional pain of a structural problem. So I recommended aggressive surgery, do it quickly and get it over with. Well, a lot of people did well, but some people did very, very poorly. And I ran across a group of papers about three years ago that showed that if you do surgery in the presence of chronic pain, you can induce chronic pain at the new surgical site up to 40, 50% of the time. In other words, you have chronic headaches and you have a hernia repair, you can induce chronic pain at the hernia site 40 to 50% of the time. In five to 10% of the time, that becomes permanent. If I had a neurological complication rate of five to 10%, I wouldn't be in business. People don't mention chronic pain as a complication of surgery. So we started a prehab process where we basically took my book, took my website, and on every patient, we try to work with eight to 12 weeks of sleep, stress, medication management, just getting to know the process. We call it prehab, and our surgical results become, became very consistent, but what was shocking is that I have now almost 100 patients with severe structural problems that canceled their surgery, because their pain went away. So here's a lady with a spinal canal that's almost on existence, about six millimeters. She's fine. She came in for a final visit before surgery, canceled the surgery. Here's another guy with a four millimeter canal. There's no CSF there at all. Same thing, back in the hills, hunting elk, no leg pain. And I just have dozens and dozens of stories like this. So this is completely unexpected. And again, a whole nother talk. So even with structural problems, as you calm down and reroute the nervous system, and again, I don't have the time today to go into to the neurophysiology of this, you shift pain pathways, you decrease the adrenaline, you change the pain threshold, you shift off of pain pathways into different pathways. And it's fascinating to watch my fellows' reaction in clinic because they're going, what? They're going, what? They're going, what? I'm going, what? And actually, t I, actually I actually tease them. I go, look, when was the last time you actually saw a surgical failure in my clinic? And they don't. I don't see surgical failures anymore. And it's not because I'm a better surgeon. I mean, I'm doing the same surgery I did for 30 years, but this whole process has completely changed the way that I view the practice. The final part, which is critical, is that a friend of mine introduced me to a concept called the complexity theory, which I don't know well enough to really discuss, but it did strike me that chronic pain is very complex, 
and in medicine we tend to throw simplistic solutions to a complex problem. So what the book does is just a book. Reading the book's not gonna change anything. So the book is a framework that breaks pain into its different component parts, and your parts are different than mine and different than yours. So it breaks it into different parts so the patient can see the parts of the pain that are affecting them. Some people sleep just fine. Some people are physically fit. Those aren't relevant to that patient. But since each patient's complex, they're actually the only one that can solve that particular problem. They have to take control. So I wanted to finish up the talk with looking at the different interventions that we have that have been mentioned today. And just talk about where in the cascade this might fit. So remember you have the sensory input, summarize the junction block, every millisecond you're having changes take place with chemical reactions, with the net result being either pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. So my first step I do is mindfulness, which I think just simply switches sensory input. So you're having some pain, and you just switch to, you know, just listen to, just listen to the sounds in the room for a second. So what you've done is just simply switched sensory input to a different input. It also decreases the adrenaline a little bit. So cognitive behavioral therapy, which by itself is not very effective, that's been clearly shown, but part of the process, what you're doing, you're now taking maladaptive thought patterns and concepts, you're switching the sensory input right there. Meditation actually is the answer, but it, most people in chronic pain can't learn it because they're in too much distress, but meditation, you, you separate from your thoughts and you learn to watch them and not react to them. So you've separated, you decrease the adrenaline, you've modulated the output here in the chemical response. So meditation is not a great starting point just because the intensity of the pain, but it's a wonderful maintenance aspect of it. Sleep is a big deal, changes everything. Um, exercise, physical therapy changes the body chemistry, but I also think it's, it also substitutes different sensations for the pain sensation from that body part. And so I think the physical, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with the gym, but there's Pilates, yoga, et cetera, all of those work. Um, life outlook forgiveness, huge deal. When Dr. Luskin's book, Forgive for Good, came into my practice about seven years ago, people started going to pain free. You're decreasing the adrenaline. So you're, you're changing the sensory input here as far as thoughts, but you're also decreasing the chemical output in terms of less anger, less adrenaline. Um, getting organized, how do you implement the plan, big deal. Medications dampen the output over here, which I think is necessary the first six months of treatment. Um, a fact that's come up this last 18 months is simply not discussing the pain. I don't allow my patients to ever talk about their pain. So again, you're changing the sensory input. And then finally, I think the ultimate shift, is I call it the spiritual journey, is that remember you move away from pain so I define the spiritual journey as good food, good wine, good friends, religious perspective if you would like. You define it any way you want, but people in chronic pain, they lose their perspective. They get sunk into this hole that's pretty deep. So that to me is actually the ultimate treatment is actually just changing the sensory input and moving away from the pain pathways. I want to emphasize one treatment that is the one step that's not the solution, but every person has gotten better almost to the person who started out with expressive writing. So we talked about Penny Baker's research a long time ago. My first book talks about negative writing. The research is quite deep. It turns out it doesn't matter. It could be positive or negative. I call it expressive writing now. You're simply separating from your thoughts. So the reason that people write and rip it up instantly is for two reasons. One of them is to write with freedom, whatever's on your mind. But the, thing, the second reason, which I think is more important, is to not analyze the thoughts, because your attention's on the thoughts. So it's only an exercise, it's simply separation, that's it. So I notice in my own experience, if I quit writing, and I wrote this morning, that if I quit writing, within about two or three weeks, these little skin rashes pop up in the back of my wrist, and my feet start to burn. So I've actually personally not found a shortcut. Most people, they get better, I can tell within seconds when they walk in the office if they started to write or not. It's also a great way to tell if a person's open to engagement. So I like to finish this talk with a short video of one of my, hopefully this works today, of uh, Mark Owens who spent 23 years in Africa um, working on saving elephants and lions. Remarkable story. Really a tough guy. He left Africa only after his third assassination attempt. So this guy is not a wimp. <laughs> so here's a picture of his spine which shows degeneration, but that's about it. 
you see these rods down to L2, and he's going to talk about that in the video. And let's hope this video works today. Last time it actually didn't work. Can you start the video for me back there? Broke my back in two places and crushed my entire left chest in and punctured my lung. I had to be medevac to Kalispell Medical Center in Montana where they fused my spine from my um, thoracic nine to lumbar two. And the pain got worse and worse and I had to take more and more opiates to control the pain. It got so bad that uh, I couldn't stand it any longer. I refused my lumbar two to my lumbar three everything from Norco to Oxycontin, Oxycodone, uh, Ultram, um, muscle relaxers, sleeping aids because I couldn't sleep, um, and um, the pain wouldn't go away. You, be, you become socially isolated by your pain because people don't want to see you suffer like that. Pain that probably went from seven to 10 all the time at times it was so bad I couldn't stand it. I would just, um, frankly, I got to a point where I wanted to die. It was. Wow. Well, finally I went to a surgeon in Spokane, Washington, and uh, he breezed into the room and said he'd looked at my charts and everything, and the only thing that was going to do me any good was <laughs> what he called a blue plate special. He said, it's going to take two surgeries. It'll take probably at least a full day and probably two days. And uh, we're going to break your back in two places. We're going to clean out all the stenoses in your spinal canal and in your nerve root canals and on and on and on. And I said, we're, in the end, he said, we're going to fuse you from your collarbone to your hips. And I said, but I won't. Well, I mean, you know. He said, it's not a good option. But he said, it's the only one that will work for you. you uh -huh. Your back's a mess. I need another opinion. And so I, I got an appointment with um, a Dr. David Hanson at Swedish Medical and, um, in Seattle and went to see him. But he said, I see nothing in your spine that would cause the pain you're feeling. It's like the phantom limb syndrome. People who have amputees often feel the same pain after an amputee. Amp after a limb that is giving them pain is amputated, as they did before they lost the limb. And it's, again, the rewiring of the brain. He said, what I'm pioneering along with some other physicians, a, um, a, t uh, a program that will provide an alternative to having yet more um, spinal fusions. And he explained that only around 15 to 30 percent it, at the most of spinal surgery uh, fusions are ever successful in alleviating pain over even over the near term let alone the long term and so he said you i would like you to try my program and i said well what does it consist of and he said well the first thing you can do is read my book on the subject and but he said immediately you can start what we call expressive writing and I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, you sit down and 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, and you write down every negative thought you have about anything in longhand, and you tear it up, and you throw it away. And I said, what? <laughs> First of all, I said, that sounds like snake oil. I was really honest with it. I said, I'm a... I'm a career scientist, and I'm taught to be a critical thinker, and very, and I'm by nature skeptical anyway, so I frankly think this sounds like snake oil. And he said, well, you can think what you want, he said politely, but he said you can always be filleted like a salmon. <laughs> and he said there'll be plenty of surgeons who'll do that, but I won't. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, um, or you can try this, this technique and, and, and the whole program eventually. I said to my friend again, this really sounds unbelievable. And uh, I said, like the doctor said, I can always be filleted. I'll just try it. 
So we drove down the coast of, from Seattle and stayed in a motel that night. And and that night I actually did some of this so-called creative writing. And uh, I, I woke up the next morning and the pain I had been feeling, which and maybe I should back up a little. When you live with pain like this, it's like you have a leech attached to your body or a monkey on your back that you can't get rid of. It's always there. It's always, you're always thinking about it. You don't, you don't realize, but it preoccupies every aspect of your being. I woke up that morning after doing this first session of, yeah. of creative writing, and the first thing I noticed is that I didn't have that monkey on my back, that leech. And I couldn't. I didn't even, at first, I'd forgotten I'd even done the negative writing, or the creative writing the night before. And I thought, what's what's going on here? You know, this is this is great. It still hurts, but it's nothing like it was. Mm-hmm. To cut, make the long story short, and after another twenty four hours, I was eighty five percent pain free. Eighty five percent pain free. And today, um, what three years later, more or less, I yes, I have pain, but it's pain that's easily controllable with a Tylenol, and sometimes I'll go through three weeks or more without even taking a Tylenol. And I'm living a reasonably normal life, a fairly active life, riding horses, chainsawing, cutting wood, you know, doing physical things, and they do make my back uncomfortable, but I don't have this debilitating, crippling pain. Basically, by visiting Dr. Hanscom, I I got my life back. So those of you in the room that work with these principles, and they're principles, everybody in this room has different books, they have different styles, but the core concepts are the same. And that's what's exciting about this whole process is that it's very consistent. If people decide to engage and take control, probably 90% of them get better. And so it's been, and this happens all the time. This is not an unusual story. I mean, it's dramatic in its duration and its effect in his story in general, but in general, we see this all the time. And people in this room understand that. So what we've done today is we looked at the cascade of chemical events that occur with sensory input being altered. We looked at the human condition as far as control and rigid thinking as far as coping mechanisms that don't work very well. The solution is a whole different lecture, but basically you learn to live with uncomfortable emotions, separate, and then as you use these circuits less, they start to atrophy, you start redirecting your nervous system in a different direction. And it's very, very consistent. And then again, my main purpose today is that I hear researchers say, well, mindfulness works. We're putting mindfulness in the schools. That's great. It's part of the solution. But understand that every person has at least three to five variables that have to be addressed before you really solve chronic pain. So mindfulness is going to work and get some benefit, but these patients are going to pain-free. It's been an incredibly rewarding process. Thank you.